University and one of the fastest growing universities in Uganda will hold its 19th graduation ceremony on December 8, 2023. I'm Professor Gasho Matkunda, the acting vice chancellor at Bishop Stuart University. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, the graduates, uh, parents, uh, sponsors, board of trustees, council, management, staff, government of Uganda, all our esteemed partners for the support in this upcoming uh, graduation. This is Chomhendo Jacqueline, Academic Registrar Bishop Stewart University. We want to congratulate all our potential graduates and thank you for honoring the timelines that we set to ensure that you clear in time and your names are ready for graduation. First, thank you very much. We can't take that for granted. Uh, we shall have our 19th graduation on 8th December and uh, our guest of honor will be Honorable Dr. Chris Badiomunsi, who is the Minister of Information, Communications, Technology and National. you anthem
learn as we learn from one another as we cut all the necessary materials from the lips of your children that you have equipped the professors that are yet to speak to us we pray Jesus Christ that you give us the knowledge and wisdom to understand so that we execute better the responsibilities that you've given each one of us and as a university of king of glory as a center of education we pray that you will give us the knowledge and wisdom so that we do a transformation that we also metamorphose the, the community that the communities around us our nation uganda will walk on the wheels of education that we offer as a university and at the end of it all we see a change we'll see a community change we'll see an individual change and your name will be glorified father we pray that you take your will and you take your place in us that your will shall drive every heart and every mind and whenever we are in those classes teaching our students whenever we are in those classes learning we will learn to unlearn so that we go out to impact the community Give us the knowledge and wisdom. We pray for our professors and the speakers that are going to speak. May you speak above them. That we will not see them, but we will hear your voice speaking. Give us your grace to do your will always. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray and trust. Amen. amen. And someone say amen to the Lord. Thank you. Yeah, he deserves another clap. Yeah, we can now sit. And I invite uh, the acting vice chancellor to come and address us and open this public lecture. But in the meantime, let me take this honor to recognize the presence of our chair council, Professor Kenneth Kagame. You are most welcome. I will also take this. The same spirit, I will come, Mr. Kamudisha, our head of Leite of the Ankhore Diocese and a member of council. Yeah, others also take the honor to welcome the deans present, uh, academic staff present, a standard chaplain, heads of the department, caretaker graduate school. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, you are all welcome. And you, our graduates, you're also welcome. How are you? Hey, you are cold. How are you? Okay, Vice Chancellor, please. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Milton, the Director of Dr. Shorens, Bishop Stuart University, the guest speaker, Professor Godfrey Asimwe, the discussant, Associate Professor Margaret Kaleo Wafula, the University Chancellor, who is on his way coming, Right Reverend Associate Professor Fred Sheridan Mwesugwa is on his way, we have just talked, Board of Trustees, Board of Trustee members around, University Council members around, distinguished political and religious leaders, esteemed partners and BSU members of staff present, Guild President and Guild Council, graduates and students, parents, guardians, alumni, and sponsors, ladies and gentlemen. Welcoming remarks. Pray the living God on behalf of Bishop Stewart University, community, 
management and on my own behalf, I have the pleasure to warmly welcome you all to this public lecture. Today, 6 December 2023. We express our heartfelt gratitude to you for honoring our invitation and considering it's worth it to attend this event of your busy schedules. I thank you so much for coming and you are most welcome. It's our pleasure to host you on this public lecture today at BSU. This is our sixth public lecture organized by BSU and I want to take this opportunity to thank you for honoring our invitation. Thank you so much. Part B is BSU background and Bishop Stuart University is a private and not for profit university. It was founded by Ankole Diocese of the Province of the Anglican Church of Uganda in 2002 and received the provisional license in 2006. The university was then chartered on 25th October 2014. Spanning over 20 years of existence, the university now recalls its tremendous contribution to the academia, research, and innovations in Uganda and the whole world. From the Teresa studies conducted, the university has since churned out notable graduates who have become uh, contributing members of society, offering services to the nation in private business, NGOs, and public sector. Our webometric rankings have also progressively improved to 13th out of 52 universities in Uganda as at July 2023. We aspire to attain single digits in the near future. Public lecture. The theme for this public lecture is transformational education and community engagement as a means for improving universities' effectiveness in contributing towards the attainment of the National Development Plan Goal Number Three. This resonates well with the National Development Plan uh, Three, and I know it will be shared as our chief guest and discussant will share with you. The guest speaker is Professor Godfrey Asime, as I had mentioned, or saluted, from Mountains of the Moon University, and the discussant, and the discussant is Associate Professor Margaret Kaleo Afra from Kampara International University. We appreciate them for accepting our invitation. You are all most welcome to this thrilling academic experience as we learn from today's discussion. 19th Bishop Stewart University, uh, 19th Bishop Stewart University graduation ceremony. Graduation is scheduled for Friday, 8th December 2023 at BSU Riverside Grounds. The guest of honor will be Honorable Dr. Chris Baljomunsi, Minister of ICT and National Guidance. I therefore take this opportunity to invite you to attend the ceremony. A total of 1,500 graduates will be awarded degrees, diplomas, and certificates of Bishop Stuart University in the various disciplines. Commissioning of graduates for 19th Bishop Stuart University graduation. The commissioning service will be on the date of graduation and the preacher and the chief commissioner will be Reverend Bernard Mushabe. See 
notable achievements. Number one, accreditation of Bishop Stuart University Research Ethics Committee, REC. BSU was granted accreditation of Research Ethics Committee by Uganda National Council for Science and Technology. REC activities have since been open to BSU students, staff, and any other researchers who include local, national, and international levels. This has certainly gone a long way in improving research and publication at BSU as well as the university rankings. We thank God for this great milestone and he deserves a big round of applause. <laughs> Number two is BSU Journal of Development, Education and Technology, JODET. We have since managed to establish the aforementioned journal which has consistently received and published articles from our students and staff and the public at large. We are happy to report that the third edition of Jodet is now out. You can get yourself a copy at Uganda Shillings 30,000 only. We still call upon those who have published our papers to submit them. And we shall now have a special issue on agriculture this coming, uh, in this month, December, towards the end. Number three, collaboration is for mobility exchange staff and volunteers. We signed MOUs for the mobility exchange programs with international partners from Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA, Mende University, Czech, or in Czech Republic, uh, Hamka University in Finland, and Pavia University in Italy. We also have an MOU with Dijang University in Cameroon, and all these MOUs are related with uh, projects which our staff have ably written and won. The partnership will not only benefit our students and staff through capacity building, but also strategically position BSU to compete at the international level. Number four, MasterCard Foundation Project. BSU through a consortium with Guru University, Muni University, and other partners which are seven in number, won a grant worth 27 a million US dollars. The project is intended to skill 100,000 youth, refugees, and nationals in settlements of southwestern, West Nile, and northern Uganda. And we signed the contract, and implementation of the four years project is already underway. BSU will be implementing uh, 2.6 million of the project total sum which in Uganda shillings will go up to 9.6 billion shillings. And this will be running for four years, but it is renewable once we perform better. Other partners include Finn Church Aid, Danish Church Aid, as well as other local partners uh, uh, who will now uh, who will participate in, skill, in skilling the youth in those refugee settlements and uh, communities around those refugees. And our institutions uh, have uh, really will be engaged, engaging the community, and uh, also benefiting our demonstration farm, because it will also have to be improved to reach the standards of the MasterCard Foundation level, we, uh, in order to make the standards of trainings and skillings that will be needed that level. Number five, students challenge. In order to pilot the problem-based learning, PBL methodology in teaching and learning, which is now the recommended methodology of teaching, the AgriScale project designed activities known as student challenges. These activities were to be identified by each partner university, at least two of each partner, for students to investigate a challenge proposed 
by a private sector or industry company together with their teachers or lecturers as mentors. And we have a variety of mentors here, business coaches, mentors, who have really ably participated and have really made this a success. With at least one challenge in each university, the students of Patna University would get an opportunity to investigate the same challenge with a host university. BSU has had the opportunity to host two challenges, namely the biofertilizer challenge and the data repository, which were done successfully. The key project outputs were, but not limited, to capacity building for staff in problem-based learning, methodology, using student challenges. This will continue to be done to equip all our staff with that methodology, which is PBL skills, and enable curriculum reviews to integrate PBL in all our academic programs. After the PBL training, the staff from the Department of Agriculture, Agribusiness, Environment went through the process of program review supported by staff of Faculty of Education and Media Studies. Here, we really work together and to make sure that we build skills of our staff to match with the current needs of the society. The problem-based learning methodology has also been adopted in the incubation hub to facilitate a full cycle of ideation and innovations targeting communities around and beyond the university. This has resulted in two great impact by solutions from these innovations. PBL, previous challenges, have also been adopted at the university farm from the reviewed curriculum, and this has improved students' skills and production at the farm with inorganic inputs applied at the farm. I would like to say that now our demonstration farm is doing very well. Number six, in chair run of 2023. We participated in the run organized by the National Council for Higher Education under the theme, Run 2023, Environmental Conservation in Higher Education Institutions. That was held in 20th August 2023, where a team of staff and students participated. And one of our students, in the name of says Akampa, won this national event in record time. We really he needs that to run. <laughs> Number seven is participation in Aspire Debate competitions in Chigali, Rwanda, which ran 1st to 5th September 2023. Our students, Mr. Agaba, Ian, and Ms. Mirembe Samali, as well as Mr. Sijire Adonia, participated in the 5th East African Universities Debating Championship 2023. They excellently presented, represented BSU, having emerged the fourth in the competitions throughout East Africa, but were the best in Uganda. They deserve a big round of applause. The patron representative, BSU, Mr. Sijire Adonia, was also nominated as the national representative from Uganda on the East African Universities Debating Council for three years. Sijire, please stand up for recognition, and you also deserve a big round of applause. We congratulate them upon such an outstanding performance. Once again, another big round of applause for the team. Conclusion, once again, I thank you for coming and attending this public lecture, and I wish you fruitful discussions. Our God reigns, Associate Professor Gashom Atkunda, Acting Vice Chancellor. Another clap. Possibly what he forgot to say, Chair Council, is that I was a team manager for the team that won the national event. I was a team manager. And I also participated seriously. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor. And uh, I think before, let me first, let me officially introduce our guests. Let me start with uh, 
Professor Godfrey Simwe, our guest speaker. Stand up for recognition. And I also introduce Associate Professor Margaret Kaleo Wafura, our discussant. You are welcome. And also, I have noticed the joy and the love the Wafura family has for BSU. Now, let me take this opportunity to, impro to introduce the Mr. Wafura himself. Yeah, that is the Mr. Wafura himself. And, I, and the children who have come to visit us. Yeah, well, welcome. All the way from Kampala, they are here with us. And we please make sure you keep with us up to Friday on the graduation. Today, our public lecture, the theme is transformational education and community engagement are the means of improving university's effectiveness in continuing toward the attainment of the national enrollment goal. Number three, what is transformational education? According to Mislo Jack, an American sociologist, in his book, Transformative Dimensions of Adult Learning, he defines transformational education as the education that motivates learners and empowers them to make, to make decisions that are beneficial to them as individuals, the community, and globally. So, when the, to the lecturers, when the students are in front of you, do you see yourself transforming them? Community engagement. According to CDC 1997, Shawa 2006, Shana Etar 2004, it is a process whereby the community engages democratically with institutions such as universities to be able to improve their standards of living. Are we doing that BSU? Do the people in Remigina know that we have a faculty of law? Have we provided pro bono services to the community? If not, then we are not performing regarding transformational education and community engagement. Community engagement is one of the requirements by National Council for Higher Education in assessing the effectiveness of the university. And yesterday in the workshop, it is one also, one of the parameters for promoting a lecturer, for promoting a certain lecturer, for promoting a professor. You must show proof of community engagement. How are we doing that BSU? Are we engaging our communities? If we are doing so, clap for yourselves. And if not, Let's go back on the drawing board and make sure that we are doing community engagement. And recently, we made a policy on community engagement. And I indicate that we are there because we have the policy. National Development Plan 3. Uganda's development agenda is geared by Vision 2040. And to achieve Vision 2040, a series of six national development plans will be implemented. And at the moment, we are implementing the national development plan three, whose goal is to, in to, increase, is to increase household income and promote good quality life among the Ugandans. Are we doing so? Much of this will be expounded and explained by our guest speaker, who is none other than Dr. Professor Godfrey Asimwe. Who is Professor Godfrey Asimwe? He's a sold man, married with his children, a wife from Mountains of the Moon. He holds a PhD in environment studies, and I indicated that he's the right person to speak to us. He is a senior international research fellow and an external examiner of various national and international universities. And that is where I was whispering to nowhere. This is the time.
to grab him to be our external examiner. He is a visiting lecturer. They call him Erasmus visiting lecture professors of Kirino University in Italy. He is a member of African Studies Association, USA. He has 37 years of experience in teaching and administration in the universities. This is our guest speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome our speaker tonight on this public lecture, Professor Godfrey Asimwe. You are welcome. In such, a, in, a, in such an event, we keep clapping until he reaches here, please. And uh, Mr. Bingana, you come and assist us in, connect, in making connections here. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Milton, the chairman, Bishop Stewart uh, Council, Board of Trustees, the Vice Chancellor, uh, my discussant, Professor Margaret. I'm most grateful for the invitation. Thank you for honoring me among many who are even more able. I was asking myself why, and many of you don't know why. Oh. And indeed, they are instrumental in development, uh, the community and the whole country. Uh, I'm not a government uh, technocrat to give a report. I try to flip the coin and point out that although uh, the scientists have been foregrounded, uh, gaps remain uh, of understanding, of comprehending the nature, comprehending the nature, the holistic nature of this community they are supposed or we are supposed to develop. And so I note that this shift to transformative uh, education is a part of a, a pattern of shifting education policies over time from the colonial to the neo-colonial or purportedly aiming at development, community transformation and all the discourses. Uh, however, as a researcher, and with a background in history and development studies, I find that this trend of shifting entrenched asymmetrical power relations and interest maximizing global architecture, where these communities, where these Africans were positioned as primary commodity producers and consumers of industrial products they never produced. So how are we to transform them? Secondly, to engage the community, it's imperative to transcend the scientifically produced material artifacts by scientists uh, because these are for human and society's use value. So we must understand the interplay of the realities and nature of humanity and social dynamics that bear on who and how humans produce and utilize the artifacts for progress.
thirdly, STEM is production oriented. So, I contend that it will have a minimum impact and mainly on the technicians. The neoliberal economic structure in which it emerged is skewed in favor of giant producers from the global north, while the global south moved more into, service, into the service sector as intermediaries and consumers of the industrial products of the north. Such a structure marginalizes local innovators for meaningful transformation of society. Fourthly, there are community level enabling and constraining dynamics and activities that shape real education life practices. So, which were these education shifts over time and why? Phase one of the shifts, the beginning of formal education and uh, our missionaries were the forerunners of this. That one was basically three R education, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and more so technical vocational to train the hand, the blacks, Negro, Bantu type of education, to supervise. The objective was utilitarian, to supervise fellow subjects, so the community in production and sustain the colonial establishment enable growth of the colonial enclave economic system. So they produced clerks, craftsmen, carpenters, technicians, mechanics, drivers, medical and veterinary assistants. Uh, that was, uh, those were the ones that engaged the community. Then there was a, a shift. As the subjects, the Africans became more conscious of exploitation and, ex, uh, and uh, op oppression, there was counter agency against colonialism. Some radical African elites filtered through missionary schools to provide leadership against colonialism. The Phelps talk Commission criticized the colonial government for this negligence, and the government took immediate interest in education. And this time, they were determined to change the character of the Africans from being radical. So they targeted, they changed from hands training to mind and heart training, the character of the Africans because they couldn't continue subjugating them. So in the 1940s, uh, higher institutions, Furabe College, Makerere, Ibadan, were started but were elevated to colleges in the ambit of metropolitan universities. So they were not the archetypal universities to stimulate critical thinking, but they were aimed at character and mindset formation for the production of politically acquiescent subjects. And after that, they introduced humanistic sciences, classics, history, religious studies, philosophy, to target the personality, to carefully nurture a desirable, admiring, polished, necktie and suit, European-like elite, Oxford accent, gentry reformist successor class. I've forgotten my necktie. Uh, Governor uh, Cohen, who led Uganda to independence, was asked by fellow officials why he was giving a scholarship to Abu Mayanja, who was an activist. And he said, uh, let the young man come in 
when he was being blocked. Let the young man come in to see me in my office. Uh, if we are going to have political opponents, and there is no way we are going to avoid that, for God's sake, let us have them at least educated. End the quote. So, my angel went to Oxford, and he was imbued uh, with gentility uh, values. Uh, this thing is freezing. I don't know why. Wait. So we go to phase three. No. To phase three. Uh, the Africans were struggling to get independence. Uh, and apart from the arms struggle, education became a complementary tool for attaining self actualization, African rediscovery and development. Now you get new. African leaders uh, coming up. So the progressive scholars and nationalists uh, wanted to reconstitute, to change the university that was teaching people subservience. Uh, because I didn't tell you that, for example, when history was started, it was teaching civilization of the Greeks, uh, the, the civilization of the British, enlightenment, to show that they were superior uh, and you were inferior. Even music uh, taught wars in Makerere, uh, uh, not uh, the, the heathen, pagan type of uh, African. So this education was supposed even to vindicate the civilizing mission to prove, to justify the, Af the white man's burden, they came to civilize, to assimilate, to transform. And that was uh, philanthropic, out of love for human beings. Uh, so we get Africans now pushing back, the, the intellectuals, the, the nationalists saying, no, 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 no. Africans also have a history. They have, uh, they were developing. So we cannot accept this supremacist doctrinaire. We must reverse this. And so you get that pushback uh, in education. And the new strategy was to inculcate African reality and phenomenon, to liberate the African elite from the trappings of colonial suprem supremacist mindset. Uh, so they even wanted to break away from Furabe, Makerere, Ibadan colleges and establish a real African university because these were reformist. They produced reformist, admiring elites. And Julius Nyerere stood out to establish uh, Dar es Salaam, different from Makere. You know, in Makere, uh, I've taught there for 37 years, uh, to, to, to study professionals, you had to put on a necktie and suit, like the lawyers and doctors still do it. So these could be but reformists. So Nyerere 
designed or shaped Dar es Salaam University differently. And some of you don't know, that's why the leadership of NRM that went to the bush mostly came from Dar es Salaam. They could go down to the people. The Makere ones joined late and taught them bad manners. But they were aiming at Koloro, uh, not good life. So we go to the fourth phase, which is the neo-colonial phase. Uh, and this one opposed the divergent African epistemology that questioned uh, and was questioned by the so-called African experts in the global north. And reversals included, they were reflected in policy prescriptions and blueprint models, presumably for the development of the so-called labeled developing world, third world. Uh, they imposed policies that depicted epistemological and ontological authoritarianism of the global north. They were derived from their conventional models and theories. Free market, liberalism, capitalism, modernization, socialism, and now neoliberalism. And these were designed by their intellectuals. For example, the model we are in now, the neoclassical economic model in which uh, our graduates are supposed to participate was designed by the Chicago School of Economics and then handed over to the uh, uh, politicians and came out as the Washington consensus that was going to be imposed on everyone and therefore have globalization. And so how are we positioned or our students positioned in this globalization dispensation? The so-called third world was made to follow development trajectories of the developed first world, that hierarchy. Thus, we continued to depend on expert knowledge from out. So when we have transformative education, this is not our own idea. It's from out to follow their pathways and interests. By the way, I insist on these interests. They have interests. My students at Makere once called the European Union uh, uh, leader and they were talking to him and they were very enraged and he pointed out that by the way, we have interests. When uh, a, one of the officials in Rwanda during the genocide went to the Clinton administration to beg that at least they stop the Nterahamwe radio, that we've been your friends for long, she got a reply that United States has interests, not friends. Uh, uh, okay. So within uh, the, the, the Cold War, that we, we must understand this context, and that's why we cannot only push STEM without understanding the software of community, of hierarchy, of power relations, of the global world, and the community in which these scientists are going to operate, in these graduates are going to operate. So, some post-independence uh, leaders sought to break away from the dictates of the Western capitalist establishment. And they paid heavily. Kwame Nkrumah, Patrice Lumumba. Patrice Lumumba just was suspected to have formed Russia. That was enough for a Belgian official to kill him 
and even exhume and dissolve his body in sulfuric acid, he kept a tooth which his daughter has fought to return. So when sometimes I see our president very brave, sometimes he removes gloves and tears them. I realize why he should need security. These people are dangerous. Obote made a speech in Singapore. The prime minister told him that he will not go back home. This is the context in which our students are supposed to operate, and they must know. So, whereas the African countries diligently followed the World Bank five-year development plan prescriptions, the World Bank came back, uninvited, it came, and put in place Uganda's five-year development plan at independence. It was like a cat coming to advise rats how to build their hole. And indeed, 10 years after, 1970s, the whole of Africa plunged in an economic crisis that was of unprecedented proportions. The whole of Africa. And what did the plan contain? The plan said increase uh, raw material production because of comparative advantage and all that. So this crisis, the African crisis, forced the African governments to go back and beg for more assistance. And these Bretton Woods institutions, World Bank sent Elliot Bag to analyze what had gone wrong in the first place, and then again advise the Africans. And that's when Bag now prescribed structural adjustment. That's when he demanded that the overextended state should be rolled back. We have privatization, liberalization, removal of subsidies, entrenchment, presumably to accelerate economic growth in sub-Saharan Africa. But this instead meant to entrench the neoliberal free market and private sector driven growth. So, although neoliberal reforms in Uganda spurred this impressive economic recovery and growth, meaningful development remained elusive as poverty increased, inequality, unemployment, and dependence. But more so, these reforms straddled all sectors, including education, an important frontline sector of international interest that is subject to influences, hence global drivers like the World Bank, coming. So transformative education, which we are hearing, uh, oh, this thing now has a, so let me use this, let me use so this transformative education, if you didn't know, is a part and parcel of structural adjustment proscriptions. The international financial institutions, these are the Bretton Woods institutions, IMF World Bank, which we established in 1945 at Bretton Woods in New Hampshire, when the U.S. was demanding an open-door strategy in colonialism, they pressed for restructuring education to respond to the market economy and address failures like increased unemployment. Again, to surprise you, in 1986, during a meeting 
with the vice chancellors of Africa in Harare. The World Bank argued that higher education in Africa was a luxury and that most countries were better off closing universities. That was the beginning, if you don't know. So there was a paradigm shift from the traditional education for public good, for manpower planning, to market dictates and pegged education on monetary quantification on the basis of rate of returns and cost-benefit analysis. Neoliberalism then espoused applied value, the ethos of applied value for marketization, transnationalism, and growth as growth, which was equated to development. And they argued that ivory tower universities were to transform into developmental universities that effectively engage the communities for their advancement. Tertiary education was seen through the prism of private good, not public good, through the lens of entrepreneurial sector market arena, economic growth, immediate market use value. There's when I went to human resources in Makere and I found that the door they had put there, welcome clients. That even students were increasingly quoted to clients. You engage in a trans transactional way. They particularly blamed the humanities and social science, uh, sciences, but they want to engage the community to develop the humanity and society without knowing the dynamics of society. So they targeted them that they are irrelevant, uh, they are useless. Even officialdom chorused. Uh, it followed that paradigm, disparaging humanities and social sciences, but paradoxically, they wanted to transform society and humanity. So humanistic sciences were blamed for producing graduates who had no applicable skills for the labor market for engaging their people. Hence, fueling persistent, the persistent enigma of rising unemployment amidst spectacular economic growth. The perceived Irrelevant humanities and social sciences uh, were compounded by their pedagogical, methodological um, shock and talk, which was considered inappropriate for the clients, the paying clients. But with the pushback, African vice chancellors protested, and the World Bank changed and said, okay, we advise you to trim university uh, funding and restructure the curricula towards the production of skills that were demanded by the market. I think you've heard officialdom harping on the uselessness and then the primacy. So attractive courses now came on board. Business, uh, human resource management, tourism, hospitality, studies, and entrepreneurship. <laughs> uh, in Makerere, we even had the secretarial studies, and somebody asked, now, are you teaching sec secretaries? We even had these typewriters. And <laughs> we had taken over YMCA. So, are these humanistic senses uh, useful? Yeah, because we are targeting to transform the community, the society, humanity. So we must fully understand the human and the society. 
and humans are the most complex species God has ever created. They change. Very intelligent. It's not like you are studying a cow if you are in veterinary. It can only be changed by a human being or a goat. Or... But a human being, uh, we need the soft way of understanding the nature of humanity to, in order to complement the hard sciences. We need to know what is it to be human and the what and how of their innovations, the materiality where of the artifacts uh, was used by society and human, uh, humanity's well-being, livelihood, how it's produced, why it's produced. You cannot tell me, people are crying, corruption, corruption. And I was shocked some time ago when I found that uh, uh, religious studies was no longer option. This is the only subject that forms the moral fabric of society. So if you underrate it, and then you start crying about corruption, about the uh, sacrifice of children, about what? I shudder. Uh, so, these illuminate humanity's heritage, the array of organizational configurations, class, group, along gender, the moral, the relational, the aesthetics, the beliefs, the values, the tests, the judgment. Somebody took pigs, the nerds took pigs to Churuhur and they were arguing how they make more money. Somebody asked, can you take a pig to pay bride price? I mean, you need to understand the people, their beliefs, their understanding, their judgments, but not to come with this uh, superiority complex. Uh, so, they also emphasized efficiency maximization approaches in education, new manag managerialism. Uh, I just resigned from a career. Uh, after giving me a post-retirement contract. Uh, before I resigned, they had brought uh, these small cameras where you have to show your head, and then they prove that uh, you are on ground. <laughs> I said, as a professor, I'm supposed to do research <laughs> or to engage the community. <laughs> I'm not supposed to be in class from eight up to, I'm not a, a, a cashier <laughs> in the bank. So, new management. Public administration, you know, before our reforms, there used to be public administration. That changed to human resource management. To manage is different from administer. Okay? So rigorous accountability. So all those uh, were the changes, the transformative education that brought. Uh, major discourses for our grounded skills training, skills which reflected also the philosophy of broader capital supply theories of neoclassical economics and enterprise, labor export, social economic transformation. So it is true that indeed Uganda needed technicians because our vocational, technical, and polytechnical education never recovered from the doldrums of, uh, of the political turbulence. And so there was a shortage in the labor supply for the economy. Uh, many of you may not know why in Uganda you can only drive a Toyota. Uh, and it must be an old model. This is because our mechanics are a trial and error, hammer and spanner. So an advanced car, <laughs> like a Subaru, <laughs> they will not repair it. They say, okay, first go home, we check. They hammer it. There was that gap. When Chogam came, 
they realized that there were no uh, trained uh, hospitality people. They had to import them from Kenya. So there is indeed a gap which was required. And indeed, the government in 1992 wrote a white paper uh, of skills development and uh, uh, of skills development. <laughs> and it was the background for uh, the uh, UBTEP. I've just got this laptop on a project and uh, for university procurement it cost five million uh, and that is uh, six months ago. <laughs> and that's efficiency. <laughs> so, So in 2008, government indeed uh, enacted and operationalized the BTV ET Act. And under the presidential initiative, reskilling programs were organized in hairdressing, carpentry, tailoring and design, shoemaking. <laughs> I think I should use the... Huh? So it's not here. Why am I saying that um, our scientists have uh, a dilemma? scientists are going to find it very hard to transform society and uh, bring about development. The reason is that the neoliberal structure is skewed, is tilted in favor of the global north. So while the growing economy uh, will certainly use a few of the technicians, it will be 
hard for the scientists, the innovators. Why? The structure is such that the highly innovative industrial production that is department one industries and secondary industries, these are the ones that produce the industries we have, are not here. They remain an exclusive preserve of the global north by powerful multinational corporations that wield monopoly power. When I was teaching in Torino, I deliberately thought about iron working in Africa. And they couldn't believe it that by 500 BC, the people we think are so remote in Buweju had mastered the metallurgy at Butari of separating iron from ore, 500 before Christ. They first pointed out the Nok culture in Cameroon. Then one student said, no, 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 th that came through diffusion. Since it is near Europe, it must have diffused. Africans cannot have really. So everything in Africa can't be African. Uh, even the good people, there is the hermetic myth that they came from Ethiopia, from Israel and what. Uh, everything good came from out. So the Africans who had mastered metallurgy in Butare, Rwanda, all over, they were making tools, 500 BC. In 2003, with the professors of technology, they import toothpicks from China. Even these scientists cannot make a screw or a screwdriver of these industries. We have, I analyzed Governor John Hall Hathorn of Uganda when he was asked about industrialization in Uganda. He said, without adequate fuel, without cheap and efficient means of transport to the sea, and without an intelligent and industrious population, there can surely be no prospect of establishing any of the heavy industries in Uganda, nor any of the secondary industries that serve and supplement the heavy industries that depend upon a high degree of skill and craftsmanship. Without an intelligent population, in 500 BC, people in deep Buhweju. So, multinational uh, giants now come as the golden investors, but only invest in import substitution. These are processing, extractive, and assembling type of industries. We assemble beer. Even the beer top is not made in Uganda. We as there is a Chinese lady, she came as an investor. There were Ugandans who were making shoes. Kayondo was one of them. Uh, the president came praising him. Now all of those have died out. So this Chinese lady has a shoe factory. Uh, they make these disposable shoes. Uh, <laughs> the shoe you wear by the time you reach there, it has collapsed. So she imports uh, uh, straps and uh, sole. So those are considered mat raw materials, so she, it's tax-free. And then she assembles the shoe in ginger, and she's an investor. So these enjoy, they are well financed. Structure adjustment demanded that we, we sell our bank, UCB, cooperative bank, which Obote had started, had started to offer cheap credit, affordable credit to our entrepreneurs. So now they are not there. All of these people you see are in the, on tenterhooks of money lenders. 
They enjoy advanced technology and benefits of economies of scale. They are locally pampered, tax holidays, exemptions, given land free, and that enables them to outcompete these scientists, these innovators of ours. How do they compete? Local investors have no protection at all. There's a time we were in a conference in Mukono, Colin Hotel, and at breakfast they served sweet beans. I said, why are they sweet? He said, they are from Malaysia. I said, beans from Malaysia, they had put preservatives, sugar, what? Beans from Malaysia in Mukono Hotel, when Mukono beans are on the menu of bean weavers, and you, you say, you are going to transform society and improve the income of those people? You meet them walking from shop right with the vera of eggs from South Africa. That now is uh, those from Colorado. There is a time they were even bringing chicken from South Africa. So these are encumbered by high costs of production. They don't have affordable capital to scale up these innovators. High market driven costs. Yaka. And in a young industrialist, utilities very high, market driven costs of utilities. Myriad taxes. The others have tax holidays. So how are our scientists going to break even? Uh, so you find the trend shows very high entry and very high mortality rate of those industries of our people. Uh, so it remains small, the industrial sector. Uh, in contrast to Asia, Asia insisted on export-led industrialization. Now, even with these import substitution industries, we now depend on them. If a span or a screw breaks, you have to, we don't manufacture even screws. But we assemble chira bus without manufacturing an indicator. Then RM government came up with Bubu, said you must buy Uganda, build Uganda. Uh, by then the president has tried. Uh, but as I told you, uh, we must support, support him, because sometimes he gets annoyed and removes the gloves. Uh, what happened to, to Nkuruma, to Lumumba, to these, uh, if you annoy them? Now they have removed the money. <laughs> they may do many things. <clears throat> but this actually uh, mainly profits the multinational investors here. It benefits them more. Now, Ugandans are not fools. Africans are not fools. They have tried. Uh, they saw apertures in some of the... Uh, products eh, that use local materials, especially in food, beverage processing. Eh? Uh, I sing around Chutuzi, Mukama Nayamba. They have tried. <laughs> and, uh, yes, concoctions, herbal concoctions, you see them in buses. Eh? Uh, 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 but uh, it's only a matter of time. Uh, the Chinese went to Congo and uh, looked at the, the tenji and took them, a fort and took it and started producing en masse. I understand Malaysia patented back cloth without a single mutuba tree in Malaysia. So the war, the young people, Nkrumah said that they fought colonialism, which they saw. You will fight neo-colonialism, which is more complex. 
So, Bubu even was undermined by our own mindset set from the colonial time, the superiority complex. Huh? You need to be seen wearing a Van Hoosen shirt, whether it is second hand or not. Huh? And uh, how do our scientists, our industrialists innovate when you liberalize and open up wholesale and they power here? All second hand. I feel pained when I pass Kalero and uh, uh, the other market, and you find second hand bras, second hand boxers. Are we still a country? Now, how will our, uh, actually, what our tech, uh, textile industries, I don't know which ones are still working. Even agriculturists, you produce agriculturists to transform the community. Africans from the colonial period were placed in the agricultural sector as commodity producers, allegedly for comparative advantage, that you, you have low skills, uh, they are suited for tearing the land, and for us we will manufacture uh, complex industrial products. Uh, but due to world market price fluctuations, coupled with the uh, poor terms of trade, for example, they would set quotas, quota supply, and more so, the double standards. As these people told Africans that you are in comparative advantage, you are best suited for tilling the land, for growing cash crops, they passed around and embarked on high-tech, heavily subsidized as they told us to remove subsidies from agriculture, health, frontline services. Agriculture in the US, in Europe, is heavily subsidized. Greenhouse production. And now I don't know how many Ugandans still grow coffee, cotton, vanilla. They left. They are not fools. And they contravene world trade regulations. So the last time in uh, one of my publications, I found that agriculture and productivity are declining. And that's why you have a rural urban drift. They are all going now into urban areas. And in urban areas, our urban areas are growing. We have uh, urbanization without industrialization. So it's the service sector. The organizations of producers collapsed after privatization, these cooperatives, extension workers, extension services, affordable credit through cooperative bank, and inputs through farm supply shops. Agriculture collapsed. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you have these giants now coming behind with their genetically engineered seeds. Again, our president is intelligent. He told them to go back and uh, study it before he signs. He's still resisting. But we have genetically modified mangoes from Kenya, <laughs> from all over, which are controlled by them powerful pharmaceutical. See, sometimes I get that. You see, all the vehicles we have are from Japan, but Japan cannot even take one Bogoya. Organically produced. There is a time, again, our president took all his uh, officials to China. Chinese are bringing here everything to beg them to buy Uganda tea. They don't. But for us, we are more Catholic than the Pope. We are more capitalist than the USA. 
So, African producers shifted to non-traditional crops. Matoke, that's where now we are. And uh, uh, this flight to urban centers uh, led to uh, crisis. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, we need to understand these dynamics under neoliberalism. Uh, so, the low level technicians, uh, these can manage to squeeze, okay? But they are also constrained by capital, by operational costs, and they manage, uh, they end up in the informal sector. Now, the informal sector, uh, some of them uh, manage to be exported outside as a uh, house girls, what in the informal sector as border border uh, riders, hairdressers, car washing, hawking, touting, sports betting, gambling, food vetting, vending. How are they going? The other day I was shocked. I was taking a taxi to Fort Porto and a gentleman jumped. I said, oh, my professor. I said, I said no, I'm the one going to drive you. I said, I saw you are the driver. He said, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a driver. Ah, I congratulated him, but I was thinking, okay, he's going to transform the, the tax sector. So, our innovators have limited spaces because of the dominance of the global north. Uh, agricultural scientists, uh, you can see how agriculture now it will be driven by pharmaceuticals. So, by the most of these are even going back to study humanities. Foresters, the forests are uh, gone. <coughs> uh, so, we have a very big problem uh, for this. And as a result, actually, National Council of Higher Education pointed out that the enrollment for scientists was declining. The number of students, this I quote even uh, National Council of Higher Education 2013, and that was at the height of the reforms. Uh, the number of science of students in sciences and technology reduced from 64, 179, that's 37 percent in 2010, to 51 thousand. And in 2011, it further reduced. Uh, in, 19, in 2014, enrollment in BTVT was only 39 thousand. Eh? And uh, it fell to 45 uh, in 2016. It fell uh, down to 45,000. That was UBOS. So the decline prompted the Budget Monitoring and Accountability Unit of Government to question whether the training was realizing its objectives. Uh, that's uh, B, uh, th this uh, Budget Monitoring Unit 2019 report. BTVET courses remained inattractive because most youths preferred universities. That was National Council of Higher Education. In health sciences, only 1.5 uh, programs were for diploma level, while in engineering, only 0.86 were diploma courses. These are reports of National Council of Higher Education. By 2016, out of 259 students enrolled in tertiary education, 72 were in universities. So you can see the enrollment. Meanwhile, graduates of humanities and social sciences found apertures in the expanding political sphere, spaces, and administration at the national and local level, where they became honorables. Eh? and officials at different levels. Many were absorbed in the donor-driven 
civil uh, society organizations, non-government organization enterprises as administrators. Uh, I had a graph here, but you'll not see it. I, I was uh, showing uh, which sectors are impacted most. So what is the way forward? We need to comprehend the nature and dynamics of imperialism. Uh, as Nkrumah said, we don't feel it. The young people never saw uh, Chiboko whipping to grow cotton or a DC. Now they are working behind the scenes. They've just only recently come out uh, for rights. They've just come out, but they are hardly seen. It is interest best and even dangerous. Secondly, we need a mass of critical thinkers about humanity, relations, and society. Even the community. Because these are the targets of transformation. So humanistic sciences come handy. So the shift from the neo uh, liberal paradigm of rolling back the state. You know, neoliberalism recently shifted again to bringing back the state in. This should be done quickly. Uh, and we should have aspects of the developmental state coming back. Otherwise, single-handedly, if you train people and you put them in a context that is restrictive, is skewed, they can't change it. So we need change at policy level. The most capitalist states are the most protectionist states. I've been, I've been to so many of these countries, but you can't simply enter. Even if you enter with a spoon of granites, you'll be arrested. They will not allow some Ghanaian friends uh, told us that the, their potatoes were blocked because they were crooked. Uh, Uganda started exporting pineapples to Germany, but later they said the pineapple from Uganda is very big. It has high content of, of sugar. Therefore, it's not to the standards of, of health, what, what, what. So they use tariff and non-tariff methods to block you. Why do you, you've opened whole cell? Uh, so, we need to rethink this removal of subsidies from our sectors, this non-protection of our incipient industries. Uh, I don't know how far the president has gone, but uh, uh, he supported this COVID X person. Uh, and in industrial park, I think there is some assistance. But we need to be bored. Uh, it, it shouldn't be, it should be a policy, not just a one off. So we need to boldly bring back our banks for affordable credit for these innovators cooperative bank, we can't continue depending on money lenders. That's not sustainable. We can't continue deceiving ourselves that microfinance, micro is micro, of Bonaba Gagaware and Tandokwa Parish Development Model will make people break even. <laughs> we'll make entrepreneurs break even. No. We need to be bored. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. Uh, those are my modest views. Uh, I thank you for sharing with me. And I look forward to constructive criticism rather than destructive praise. Uh,
I acknowledge the presence of my teacher in senior three, Mr. Basil. Uh, <laughs> part of this knowledge is from his bald head. Thank you. Ah, uh ha. -huh. What an impressive presentation. He has philosophically dissected the sim. Thank you very much. You deserve another round of appraisal. How transformative are we in our education? But for us, who are preaching transformational education, are we transforming ourselves? Thank you very much for the presentation. And also, but uh, what I saw a laptop of five million. Yeah, and now uh, during the t during the presentation, we are joined by our vice, our chancellor, chancellor, the right level and associate, Fred Mwesigwa. You are most welcome. We are always energized whenever you join us. Let me now take the opportunity to invite uh, uh, Dr. Rabeka, the Dean Fiest, to introduce to us our discussant. Thank you. The Chancellor, Bishop Stewart University, and my Lord Bishop of Ancole Diocese, Chair Council and members of Council present, our Vice Chancellor and members of top management, colleagues at Bishop Stewart University, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Rebecca Kalibuani. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Agriculture, Ag Agribusiness and Environment, but also acting dean of the Faculty of Agriculture, Environmental Science, and Technology. I now have the pleasure to introduce our discussant this afternoon she is Mrs. Margaret Kareo Wafla. She is Associate Professor at Kampala International University, where she is Assistant Deputy Vice Chancellor, Assistant DV DVC, in charge of research, innovation, consultancy, and extension. Uh, Mrs. Wafula prefers that I do not elaborate on her lengthy CV and distinguished profile, but nonetheless, I can assure you that the taste of the pudding is in the eating. So when she comes here, you'll be able to work out how lengthy the CV is and how distinguished the profile is. She is married to Mr. Innocent Wafula, and these days they add a man <laughs> with three children who are seated somewhere behind. So I take this opportunity to welcome Professor Margaret. Please welcome Professor Margaret with, um, along with me. You're welcome, Professor.
I've been promoted. I'm an associate prof. Yet to work for the professorship. There is a big gap there. <laughs> anyway, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Permit me to adopt the earlier protocol laid. I'm a great career. I bless the name of the Lord so much for having been granted an opportunity this evening to stand here to 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 contribute to humanity. Um, and I want to start with a few inputs or food for thought from what Professor Asimwe has really thoroughly dissected. The huge question remains, who is to blame for all this? Who is to blame? If I, if I have a learner who goes out there and they end up a, as a driver, who is to blame? Is it the education system? And if we are talking about the education system, who is the education system anyway? So when we are looking at the, the, the topic we have today, transformation, education, and community engagement, as means of improving universities' effectiveness in contributing towards the attainment of the National Development Plan goal, I don't want us to look at the university as, you know, Bishop Stewart University, KIU, you who is in the university offering the services are to blame. Me and you. We are to blame for the kind of products we are putting out there. How are we offering our delivery? In, in any case, what exactly are we offering? There was recently um, a clip on social media where, where someone complained and said, where is... <laughs> When I was going to school, she was the minister. What was the relevance of the prelims of North America in my curriculum? And you would be shocked and amazed that even then, our, our curricula are still wanting. I mean, even when they declare them expired, we still submit probably expired, expired. Because at the end of the day, what we deliver is going to be measured by the effectiveness of the products that go through our own education systems. So who is to blame? I, my approach to the topic was self-assessment um, self as an institution and as an individual. So let's just look at a few highlights that Prof. Godfrey pointed out. For example, he says that many of our innovators who have startups do not have capital to scale up what they have. The question is, do they have the critical thinking capacity and ability to use the minimal raw material they have. Even Rome was not built in one day. And I'm very sure with the motto I saw here, our God reigns, despise not the days of a humble beginning. So as our learners get out of here, are we able to empower them with critical thinking to think out of the box and utilize what is around them. I think that could make a difference. And I mean, if we were to give them critical thinking, we ourselves who are supposed to empower them, are we critical thinkers? Have we been able to unlearn so that we relearn and empower the learners to fit into the trends of the demands so that they fit into an inclusive society. What are we training? How are we training it? And are we 
Do we have the competence anyway? Take an example. When we were facing COVID, the lockdown, very many higher institutions grumbled around with the forge of uh, online studies. What happened when COVID ended? Were we able to catch up with the pace and demands of technology to equip the learners as per the challenges that go beyond our own individual institutions but fit into the global demands? That is food for thought for you and me as an educator at higher institution. Next he said, that uh, <clears throat> everything in Africa can't be African. Everything in Africa cannot be African to the extent that we cannot afford even to make much boxes. I mean, even when we make them, it requires, in quotes, expatriates to come here and take advantage of the policy to make us match boxes. He mentioned toothpicks. Who is to blame for the African product not being African? I think we are our own enemies as Africans. We have a mentality that whatever is not African, it's superior. So while we may argue that the outside people have superiority complex, then probably we ourselves also have to deal with the, what's the opposite? Inferiority complex. It's an issue of the mindset. Probably when you go out there, or when we walk out of this place today, Let's learn to celebrate African. When we learn to celebrate African, we empower the African to go to another level. And that African will go beyond the boundaries of our own locality and not so long their product will be equally celebrated. Look at our productivity. Look at the coffee. The quality of the coffee that is given to Ugandans and the quality of the coffee that goes out, it goes back to our mindset that since we are inferior, then we deserve inferior and we also um, quantify what African has made as African and below standards not to be consumed. Prof. Father pointed out, he, it was actually a question. <laughs> he said, why are the science going to find transformational education so hard? And he said that because all this, the neoliberal attitude, all structures in place are skewed to the global north, and the people, the technical power companies have added advantage. But you know what the problem is? When we look at the policy makers, he said that we should look um, at policy implementation and change. The challenge of Africa is that policy makers we only adopt a policy that favors our interests. You want to quote me? We dare not even change, we, we, we even dare change a policy at point T to shift it into our favor. Who is in charge of that? Who is going to be the revolutionist? How are we going to empower the learners? 
Because when we talk about transformation education, we are talking about a learner who comes up in the education system with a different attitude, a different perspective, but we equip them to transition that perspective such that they have a self-actualization, a self-realization, both to interact with the, with the local community around and also view issues from the global perspective. So if so to say that our, human, our learners from the humanities have found themselves docketing into the politics and they become policy makers. Policy makers who have not been transformed by the education. Do we hope to have change? What could be the metrics of the effectiveness of university education in the long term? I said, it's food for thought. Prof also pointed out the role of um, WHO where they at one point dictated the kind of skills that should be trained in our curriculum that are on demand. The question is, who determines the skills that we need? And what market are we talking about? All right. If we are looking at the international market and the demands of the skills on the international level, how many of our learners are able in, to equitably tap into that employment. Take note, equitably. Yes, these skills are on demand, global-wise, and every the other year, so many institutions are producing learners. Okay? Are they given the opportunity to compete favorably with no favor, you know, equitably, such that everyone has the opportunity to tap into these opportunities on a well-balanced scale. All the opportunities are for a chosen few. In Uganda here, we enjoy Nogamba Nogu. But also on the international scale, there is Nogamba Nogu. One time I benefited from a scholarship from the Ministry of Education. But do you think it came to public? Did they know it? Confession time. <laughs> okay? So the, the, equi the equity, the equality, as we send to the pool of employment out there, we may have to on what exactly the skills we need. And probably also to engage the learners themselves to know where do they want to go so that we curtail our training into the skills, implying that the end gives justification to the means. May I also point out that this was a little bit touching and I believe the clergy in the house will agree with me and probably once we throw blames, the church may also have to position itself. In many of our learning and facilitation, morals, ethics, human heritage has been forced 
literally forced to be erased. And the changes or the change management probably does not give provision for emphasized supervision. For example, recently I was surprised when our learners were choosing courses to do in year three, the new curriculum. And normally we tend to think that new is modernization. Of course, there is an aspect of modernization, but there is also an aspect of compromise. Where I was told that Sierra is no longer, uh, you know, a mandatory paper to do. So here I was as a believer arguing with Elana, you have to do Sierra E. You have enough verses in your head to do this, we shall get a D1. Ah, uh, uh, mommy, no, 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 no. I think I would rather do French, it's a language. Since when did Sierra E become a, a language? So, who is to blame? We are talking about transformational education. I want us, at whatever different levels we are at, to, to touch, to self-reflect, and see how best, how best to solve the dilemma we have at hand. He further said that we can only progress, he, he quoted some person from the past, who said that we can only progress and develop if and only if we have intelligent technical generation. It seems we have the technical generation. But the question is, are they intelligent? And with the technical capacities that we have, what exactly are we using the technological knowledge for? Intelligent, technical persons. By the way, Prof. Asimwe, you mentioned that... Um, that um, it would be very hard, I think, for the humanities to fit in because of the kind of skills that they're given do not fit the demands. I'll tell you an experience of Alana, who was one time a first class degree learner in one of our institutions here in Uganda, a civil engineer. And you know when you are declared as, you know, the best at a graduation, like one we are going to have on Friday, the employers are also all over looking for you, okay? So this person, many people got her contact and called her. From graduation, she was immediately employed. She later tells us a story after one month. <laughs> This is a person who had four in four at primary, eight, eight at all level, straight A's at A level, and also at university, was the best, the best of, the best. One month later on she says, I wonder what exactly we're doing in those lecture rooms. The mathematics proving is you disintegrate or what? I've forgotten my mathematics. But she concludes by saying, everything I've been trying to deduce on those boards, I could not find applicability in the field. So, when the NDP3 talks about improved well 
being and creating jobs making sure that there is employability as trainers at higher institutions of learning are we contributing to the pool effectively and what measures our 100% bar if we are expected to be 100% effective where are you at where am I at? Where is KIU? Where is Bishop Stewart? And any other institution? Then the remaining percentage. What efforts are we able to put in place so as to fit into the gap that our key speaker pointed out? Can I bring another school of thought that every one of us is to blame where we are? We've embraced neocolonialism with our whole hearts. Not only in education, but in every aspect. And I can give you a simple evidence. Why is it that no one is wearing a gomez this evening? Whoever told us that Kansas only go for introduction? Does any one of us has, have a, a, a skirt, a suit made out of back cloth? Love and change is going to begin with you and me. And it's about the change of the mind. There should be ways of mentoring the mindset of the facilitators just as there should be ways of coaching and mentoring and growing the mindset of the learners. So it's from that perspective I come. For me, I want us to do a critical self-check. If, if we look at uh, the National Development Plan, Goal three. It has a number of objectives, but I specifically spotted out where education or higher institutions must tap into. And then while we tap into that, we have the global aspect. We have the SDGs. How are we aligning them to our deliverables within the education sector? This has already been pointed out. Basically, the theme of the NDP3 is to have a sustainable industrialization for inclusive growth, employment, inclusive growth, inclusive. Implying it must be all encompassing. Inclusive growth, employment, and sustainable job creation. If you were to do an empirical study and went to the marketplace, went to the shops, went even to the conductors that pull doors, many of, the, many of those people have gone to school and actually they are degree holders. But the challenge is, what we give them does not create job in line of the skills that we've given them. And when they fail to do that, they get dockets elsewhere. It becomes survival. And not before long, if the trend continues decade after decade, then probably we shall appreciate that probably university education is not as relevant as we thought. And the change has to begin with us. 
So they have uh, a number of uh, strategic strategic uh, objectives. Maybe before I go to that, going back to a point that our key speaker said, uh, that at one point a research was done and it was noted that um, many learners opted to go to the degree, to be enrolled into the degree other than the certificate. Permit me to submit, ladies and gentlemen. It's still an issue of the mindset. Because you know when you say I'm a degree holder, everyone feels like, huh? A degree holder. Not until one day you find a professor who has failed to be a job creator dragging on the street equally miserable like a non-degree holder. These are facts. Go and find out what happened during lockdown when education settings were closed. Mostly in the private sector with a whisper. <laughs> okay? So the number of strategic objectives that we ourselves as educators need to align ourselves to as per the plan. But still I picked out what pertains to higher institutions. To strengthen the private sector to produce jobs, and then to enhance the productivity and well-being of the population. So if we are to enhance the productivity and, and well-being of the population, then certainly we must look both within the university environment and also outside the university environment, thus the relevancy for community engagement. And the corresponding framework says that increased generation of better skilled, implying that we have a skilled population, but still has room for improvement. And how we define that room for improvement and the strategy of improvement is going to de be dependent on how our strategy and approaches in community engagement, as well as delivery of trans delivery of education okay this workforce must be motivated and healthier I was telling someone one day when I was growing up some of us are old school so when we were growing up with my fellow old school you would go to a bank and see seriousness of the highest order. The entire environment felt everyone was serious and they put value on what they were doing. Currently, you go to a bank and you even find a visitor who has come to see Akashia, a teller. So, the National Development Plan, Goal 3 says, they want to see a workforce that is healthier, motivated, because probably what we are seeing right now is because the motivation is not there. This one also points out to the fact that motivation may probably not only have been picked from class as an instructor, or as a teacher, you know universities hardly have teachers since many of us are there by osmosis and not training. So you find many instructors there. Okay? So probably this person was motivated, but when they get into the workplace, they are not motivated. What is the role of the university, of our products, far beyond the gates of the institutions or far beyond the gates of the classroom. Would we consider, uh, maybe if I'm handling Yatutu, would I consider that it's my responsibility to see that a learner, by the time they are going out of the university in year three, they still have what I instigated in them 
in year two. Or after submitting end of semester exams, that is none of my business. And then the other bit of the framework is to see a strengthened private sector that is able to drive growth and initiate collaborations. I think that's where, in particular STEM, we need those soft skills. I normally, well, my background, my first degree is in computer science. So I normally see learners object when uh, you give a curriculum that has anything that is not technical. They will object. They say, no, as we, here, we are here to learn softwares and any other applications. So while we inject all the technological stuff, all load, into the STEM curricula, if we are going to achieve that objective of collaboration, empathy, empowering society, then the STEM to need, or probably need more, the soft skills so as to neutralize the mechanic aspect that even eats up our own thinking. So what is the role of the universities vis-a-vis -vis the strategies that NP3 has put up? Enhance skills and vocational development. How are we going to do that? Let's look back onto the way we deliver. Even if it is humanities, we should deliver in such a way that we are able to pull learners away from theore theories and they go and apply the theories. That implies also the way of examination is important. Recently I was arguing with someone, do we really need PhDs to sit three hour exams? Food for thought. Be supervised three hours of course, that's the PhD me I did. But food for thought and vocational development. In our education systems, we have uh, school practice. Some programs have internship, internship placements, industrial placements. If we had to enhance skills and vocational development, then we have to hype the framework of quality assurance on how these particular sections of the curriculum are done. Or else, yes, a learner may have credit on their transcript, but without empowered vocational skill. So, QA and all stakeholders involved. We need to rethink on how to do that. The other is promote science, technology, engineering, and innovation. On the national level, I think we should appreciate the government for having an entire docket that addresses science, technology, and innovations. In our institutions, we should have well-equipped with strategic guidelines and targets of innovational ecosystems. For example, you may have a course, maybe software engineering, these learners every the other year, they are graduating. And when they graduate, they do graduation projects or research, whatever you call them. What happens to these graduation projects? Do people just present 
and after presenting, we shelve them. We give, we, 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 we give them A plus, C plus, whatever. What happens to this? We can actually take these ideas and grow them into entrepreneurial products and they be patented. Can we take an inventory of how far our various STI ecosystems and institutions could have gone if we did that? But of course, it's never too late to do the necessary. And also, I find a bias. Whenever we talk about innovations, we get a little so bit biased with the technological aspects. We quickly, we quickly think about computing, engineering, but I mean, even in the social sciences, even in law, there are innovations. So let's reach out to the pools of our institutions and spot the people with talent. You know, so in our pool of learners, there are those learners who come to university not to pick skill, but to pick a paper. Okay? So let's spot out these persons so that we are able to nurture their ideas of innovation and grow them to reality so that these entrepreneurial ideas, when they are matured, they can contribute both to the benefit of the institution and the learner. By so doing, actually, we shall be teaching these people to be job creators. Why hatch an idea and just leave it at assessment point? The other strategy is promote development oriented mindset. This particular strategy beat my understanding. Could it be that for all the generations Prof. Godfrey has talked about, the mindsets are not developmental? Have we had generations of people who are visionless, without vision? Or probably it's the case that where we have vision and vision only is, you know, demarcated to our individual self and not beyond me and the society in which I live in. Because if we inculcate developmental mindsets, then we shall have people who think beyond their own families, but also who desire to see the development of the society that nurtured them. And this is a responsibility of every one of us. So even if you are teaching mathematics, don't go and speak only about mathematics. If the mathematics lecture talks about this, another one from communication skills talks about it, the statistician comes and talks about it, I think this consolidated effort shall mold the generations that we are nurturing. And you will agree with me, the generation today is a very amazing generation. One time, not long ago, I told my learners to be on time in class at eight. Of course, it was raining, and I knew it was raining. Then someone posted, Madam, it is raining. Madam, it is raining. Another lecturer told me, the person told them, the roads are bad. And indeed they came late because the roads are, are bad. So if we, have, we are, if we have such a generation, then development will not be a reality. So while we put infrastructures in place, we do the training, then also in the education system, as university facilitators, you may have to take on a parental role. Some people have grown, but not nurtured. Food for thought. 
via their strategy, enhance partnerships with non-state actors for effective service delivery. And it's this that we have community engagement. Partnership beyond the internal partners. The challenge we have, normally when we talk about partnerships, institutions of higher learning will think about the government. If not, they'll think about some guy in nowhere. They'll think of some donor in UK. Which donor and funder will come with their own ideologies that they also have to assert? And remember, between me and you, there was a silent message that was passed. We have to deal with the inferiority complex. So when we are looking at partnerships, then let's incorporate community engagement the right way we ought to. They themselves can also be very good partners. So as to ensure that we fulfill the goals of NDP3. Here, this slide is just for food for thought. You see the eyes? Huh? Am I fine? After all this has happened, am I doing things right? It's moment of ponder. As an educator, think. The guy in pink up there who is doing this, the robot, it's thought. When we are talking about innovation in higher institutions of learning, what exactly is innovation? Because we are saying, let's improve innovations. We need an eco environment that has innovations, empower innovations. As an educator, to you, what's an innovation? Do you know even changing the approach you teach can be an innovation that impacts life? Your assessment can be an innovation. Going an extra mile. That is beyond what quality assurance comes to monitor out there. Can be an innovation. So to you, what is innovation? And in your day-to-day -day operation, in your delivery, as a stakeholder of higher institution of learning, how innovative are you? And what innovative skills have you passed on? to the people who go through your hands. The other ponder is the heart down here. That heart looks beautiful. When we were coming here, I told my sons, we found somewhere a heart that was storied. And I asked them, is that a heart or it's a storied building? The shape is a heart, isn't it? It was a heart, but it was a storied building. So I asked them, is that a heart or a storied building? They insisted, it is a heart, but with a nice roof. So, curriculum package versus delivery. It is very possible to have a well structured curriculum that will be ratified with no objection. The packaging is good. How do we deliver it so as to ensure that we are offering skilled workforce that is demanded by this development plan? The other, food for thought, moment of ponder. Who is your partner? 
if we are talking about partnerships, collaborations, community engagements, who is your partner? At times we have partnerships that are not partnerships. I'll justify the statement. Partnerships that are not partnerships. For example, I, I get a partnership with Dr. Milton, but in the entire engagement, mine is to only do what I'm called to do, what I'm instructed to do. Is that partnership? We are in a generation where we must look at our learners <laughs> who are called clients in some corridors, like my senior said, as co-partners. Even in the way work is delivered in class, right from the conception of the curriculum itself. The next ponder, moment of ponder, is the mindset. Is my mindset a fixed one or I have a growth mindset? As an educator, because when you are talking about universities, they are made up of us. It's like what I would borrow from the church. When we are talking about church, we are not talking about the building. We are talking about the people. So me as a university, as an individual, a pertinent component of the entire structure, is my mindset fixed or do I have a growth mindset? I'll give you an example. Right now, everyone is talking about machine learning, artificial intelligence, robotics. Hmm? It would be catastrophic when you're in that field and you cannot realize that actually there is need to shift and I adopt. Therefore, if we are talking about transformation education and if it's going to deliver rightly to the effectiveness of our role as universities, then we should appreciate that not all education is education. And less the learner changes, their perspective and outlook to life beginning with self-realization realize their need and role and contribution to the society, local society they are in and also know that their opinion how do they input onto the global levels and the other way around how does the global move affect me as an individual and how should I transition once they have that then they will, they will be in position to make informed decisions and actions at the respective levels collaboration, empathy connection with all other human beings and nature shall become a walkover therefore for education to be of high quality, it must be transformative. And that directly inputs established and maintained. How do we do that? Let's involve the community at all the stages of the activity we want to engage with the community. Let's take their opinions. Let, let's make them co-leaders. Because also as educationists, we have a, a superiority complex. Okay? We go to the community and we assume we know what they need. So we place them in the followers boat while we sit in the driver's seat. 
So let's engage them. Let's have their opinion. However small it is, let's pick the positive. And it all goes back to the mindset. Once we do that, we shall be able to entrust the community with more responsibilities. Of course, that notwithstanding, we cannot work outside the cover and the backup, support, integral partnership of the local governments and the central government at large. After all, the development plan we are talking about was hatched by them and thus we have to feed into it. There is something, however, I found a little bit I would disagree with. When they were talking about capacity development in the National Development Plan, and one of the results, or expected results, they said is to keep longer, school years to keep longer, to keep longer in school. I don't think for me to have lifelong learning, I must be in school. Unless the conceptualization of school is revisited. Therefore, our community engagements should be community driven. For example, in Afghan Afghanistan, they were able to build schools and different settings based on the problems that the community had raised. A back for thought. A back for thought. Like I said, we are universities. We want to input into the national development goal, but we also look at the global perspective and particular universities. There is the SDG one and poverty in all its forms everywhere. Prof pointed out that many of us say that you know when we are looking at success in education and try to measure to measure it, we tend to monitor monetarize it. We tend to express it in terms of money, but is all poverty packaged in monetary terms. So as universities, are we able to spot out the various forms of poverty and our delivery addresses all? Who is to blame? Who is to blame for all these things that, that are happening? Who is to blame? And what are we training? And how are we training? Usually when I'm, I'm, I'm teaching my, my PhD class, Human Resource, I ask them, if you are now taken to Harvard University to work as Human Resource Officer, can you easily fit there? I want to also ask this question to our fellow, my fellow lecturers here. If you get a job in Harvard or Oxford, can you easily take off? I can can our can. graduate compete equally in the global world? Ladies and gentlemen, those are very, very many uh, usually big questions or pertinent questions to ponder on. And Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together and big round of applause to Associate Professor Margaret Wafula for all that information. Now, it is time for questions and comments. I'm going to give you only 10, allow only 10 questions. Then they answer them for the interest of time. And then we, because we have a lot on our agenda. I want someone to get me a microphone. Yeah, let's Sijire. Sijire, come and take uh, this microphone around. Yes. 
The first question, that gentleman in black, black shirt, yes, yes, Mr. Wafula, the first question, then Dr. Enoch, next. Thank you so much, our facilitator. As we look into innovations, this goes to our facilitators as well. When we talk about innovation, let's have the imagination of Minister of Health distributing mosquito nets, and then the nets end up in the community, to the informal sector, the non-educated, who change the mosquito net into a nursery bed protection. Is that innovation? Is that innovation? So how do universities think and approach a community like where we are now with a population of the non-formal educated, the informally educated, and partly the formally educated who are the smallest in the community? Who are the smallest in the community? Then I also come to the question that Associate Prof brought in relation to social and social and economic development. We look at how does a person who is studying here as a lawyer dress immorally and is going to impact and deal with moral issues in court? How do we deal with that issue also? How do we deal with fragmentation in education where we see the institutions of education and we are not seeing the church and we are not seeing the family. What I'm learning is not connected to the family. What is happening in the home is not connected to the church. And yet at the end of the day when I come out as a product of education, my influence is going to the three pillars that make education. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wafura. I think you have noted. Uh, Dr. Enoch, make your question so brief. Thank you so much. Mine is a comment. What has happened? I've always asked this question to the students I teach. Who is to blame for the mess in the world? Who is to blame? The other day, MPs were at war in the parliament. Who is to blame? If you take that question, you may find I would want to, to borrow uh, Dewey's view that we go for de schooling. Let us disband schools. If you are a professor or a teacher, go to the community and teach from there. What are schools for? And when we talk about the products from school, every time we mention, we mention the workforce, what is it that we, we produce these people to do, the workforce? And whom are we teaching for? We forget that we are teaching for communities. And we isolate communities from whatever we do. But we continue saying workforce workforce. Okay. We need to look at the communities we teach for so that we are able to bring out the people that are competent producers and consumers of the goods and services in those communities. Thank you. Thank you. Who is to blame? There is a hand there. Yes, uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Muhumuza Simon, and I will be graduating tomorrow next with a Master of Science in Climate Change and Food Security. I am doing some lecturing in Uganda University. I have one uh, comment and then one question. Quickly. Uh, my, uh, the question the doctor talked about who was presenting previously wanting to help communities, but enforcing our own ideas onto them, not listening to them. 
there was a, a situation whereby a team of experts were engaging with farmers and then they asked them to tell, the, to tell them what their problem was. And they highlighted a problem as weeds in their farming. Weeds became priority number one problem. But these people ignored it because they had their other interests. Now, one of them was an agriculture officer who later on, after retiring, realized that what the community was talking about is already affecting him. So how are we going, we as experts or as elites, how are we going to bend down to ensure that we are able to listen to the needs of the community to serve them better? Then my comment was, or oh, is, I have been pursuing this mass of science, but what I find lacking and I would need that the university looks at, somebody who is doing a mass of science should be able to have a community project which is related to the challenges that are caused by climate change. And this must be given a time and also supervised seriously and become a basis for uh, accrediting or awarding such a candidates. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Yes, Professor Kagame. Bring the microphone. I think I like the last comment Yes, about the relevance of the research mm. that he does to get what he gets. That put aside. Who is to blame? I think universities are to blame. Academicians are to blame. Because they know and yet they don't tell. The only, master, the only PhD in history that I know, the only person I know, comes from Poro in, in Tungamu. But there's a lot of confusion about Mpororo Kingdom. And there's no textbook on Mpororo Kingdom. There's a lot of history how civilization came from the source of the Nile, went up to Egypt, and eventually the rest of the world. Eh? Unfortunately, it has, not, it has not come back. There is evidence that the kings of Egypt, the, pharaoh, the pharaohs, the burial and coronation would not be complete unless somebody from Central Africa, presumably Songora, was there to organize and bless the ceremony, meaning that the grandfather of Egypt was in Central Africa. Many of us know the insult called Shenzi, Shenzi, S-H-E-N-Z-I. Mm. Shenzi is an insult, eh? But it was a word used by Arabs at the coast to describe people of the kingdom inside, eh? There was a powerful kingdom called Shenzi all the way from Egypt to South Africa. And we have evidence of development in Zimbabwe, in Uganda. Nobody teaches about the Shenzi kingdom. And it was so powerful that even had an ambassador in China. Africa was so powerful that the oldest higher education institution was in Egypt. Nobody talks about it. They distort history and talk about Spain. The oldest correct scientific medicine textbook was written by somebody, I think, in Morocco, around there. Huh? Nobody talks about him. Colonialists came to Bunyoro in 1890, 1970 or something, and documented with pictures a Bunyoro doing cesarean section using Tonto as an aesthetic. But they say they are teaching us medicine. In Kisi in Kenya, right before colonial times, they were doing craniotomy for subdural hematoma. If you Google craniotomy in Kisi, you'll find that history. If you Google cesarean section in Bunyoro, you'll find those facts published in journals. Eh? So we have to create pride in ourselves. Before you are proud, you cannot believe in your innovation. The colonials came to destroy our pride. They took away our language. They took away our religion. They dehumanized us, demoralized us. Unfortunately, we haven't recovered yet. Before you recover, you can't innovate. You can't be a successful scientist. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. 
At BSU, we can't be blamed because we know the way, we show the way, and we go the way. Last arm, and, and then that gentleman in front, and we close. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Noel, for such an opportunity, and uh, thanks to our facilitators, Professor Curry and Professor Asima, for such a wonderful public lecture. Uh, I have a question in a context where what we have learned do not prepare us for the challenges we face today, what are we really supposed to do? Because uh, while you were presenting, you mentioned on what we are teaching, how we are teaching it, and whether we have the competence that is really necessary to, 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 to yield results of which all of us expect. So I'm wondering, in case we find the solutions we have today, because now like this global agenda, they are developing different solutions, but I don't know whether they are putting uh, in plan the context of different situations. Because if now America is fighting with the problem of how they can integrate technology to improve health and education, are we really at the same pace with that country so that may be the solution they are proposing. They align with the challenges we face in Uganda today. Or if they are aiming at getting 50% of students in schools, are we really at the same level of enrollment rates and maybe retainment rates so that we could compare ourselves with them? Thank you. And then the last question, I would want to comment on spotting the talent. Professor Carreo talked about spotting the people with talent, and I have a question. We have come across where different lecturers... Make it so brief, eh? Yes, could identify students who have talent and maybe in different workplaces. In a context where you find the people you are working with, or maybe this talent you've spotted, you're fighting with power problems or there is an imbalance of power, how are you supposed to handle it as maybe an employer or from the worker perspective? Thank you so much. The last question, I was given seven minutes, it's now eight minutes. Last question, make it so brief. Thank you, mine is not a question, it is a commendation. Okay. I'm a farmer, I'm a practicing farmer. I belong to Mbadifa, Mbara District Farmers Association. So I want to commend BSU, because we are partners on the docket to internship placements. So on community engagements, I want to highly recommend the practice of taking the interns to farms direct and so on. As in Badifa, we have a commitment as it has been, but when uh, we are introduced to community engagements, I saw and I internalized that our, strat our strategy as in Badifa is right because when these students are not taking the farms, they only end at institutions without engaging the communities. So I commend that and as in Badifa, we have a commitment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As we said, we know the way, we go the way and we show the way. Now time for answering those questions and then Thank you. It's nice to know that we had such an attentive audience. Thank you so much for the feedback. Uh, a number of things have come up. Some are policy issues. Some are just, you know, people or process competence concerns. For example, the very last one, uh, where someone talked about uh, spotting talent, but in the process, you meet power challenges. Everywhere you go in life, you will meet power challenges. And how you handle the resistance and to amicably address the differences, you will either succeed or not succeed. 
So basically, resistance is part of the game, but how you manage the person and the system will give you a bonus or no. Then aligning our solutions to other lands that are, have development, different development levels. You know, that's why we said that who gives us the solutions? Who identifies the skills we need? Who determines the demands of the market? Um, I'm told at one point Nigeria and Uganda were at the same economic level. But f due to different forces, one nation escalated while the other stayed behind. So while it is okay to take up different formula from others, let's study our own context. What we are bringing on board, does it apply? Is it viable or, or not? The other one was a comment about uh, products that as, a, 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 as empowerers of learners, we normally forget that we are training for the community. Uh, on part of the learners, I promise you we shall change. We shall look at the bigger picture. Um, the other thing, I'll give it to Prof. As, as are we ourselves, what are we doing to decolonize? What, do we, what, what is our contribution towards decolonization of Africa? Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Margaret. Who is to blame? Uh, I start by commending um, Bishop Chamugambi. Uh, when we were starting this university, he envisioned uh, a special character coming out from this university. Indeed, when uh, these religious uh, uh, institutions were in control of, of education, the products were different. They made sure they inculcated a certain character. But when they, there was the liberalization and the students learned that cheating exams and getting A, A, and that's the ultimate. And, uh, in Makere, we are seeing a very big change from the traditional students of uh, Gayaza, Nabingo, and the ones from, uh, uh, from the client, the entrepreneurial schools. Uh, they learn that uh, to go to parliament, you, you cheat, you bribe, you... It's not a service, but it's a business. So, I think there has been a change. There is a neighbor in our village who was a head teacher, and uh, when they came to... Long ago, in, in the early 70s, when the inspectors found out that there was a mess in finances, the man committed suicide. But now, if you don't steal, I was somewhere when they were burying Katega, and people said, how can you be a minister for this long and you don't have apartments? And, eh? Can you imagine? Uh, Nyerere tried to lead the way. But now, if you have power, that's an opportunity. That's a, so society has changed. And that's why I'm worried when they say that uh, religious studies is no longer compulsory. I must uh, commend our archbishop uh, when he stood up to the north and said, uh -uh, we had better break off if you are uh, dictating this to us. And I think we need more such people, more such leaders. Otherwise, things are going wrong. <laughs> she was very right to, to 
to blame the humanities and social sciences for producing people who reach there and make funny policies. They, the first policy they make is to increase their allowance. <laughs> yeah. So are they people community-centered? Again, I must also commend Nyerere again. Uh, Nyerere one time, told it's still a policy. He told students, the, the, the university told students that now you are going for national service. They have to go there. The students refused. Yeah? They were like the Ibadan for a Bemakere students. Uh, they refused. Why go to the village? So the chancellor, who is the, uh, the president, Nyerere, came to the university. They were rioting, and he said, okay, now there is a story. There was hunger in the village. The people collected money and said, let's pick our few strong people who are still strong to go and look for the food. They gave them the money to help them go and look for the food. When they reached there, they didn't go back. So he said, people have collected taxes to pay for your education. When you reach Dar es Salaam, you don't want to go back. So, we are not going to give you the money again. Go out, there are buses, you are expelled. The community was central. But I think now we are so much into, in, is it business type driven by a, you can do anything and get out with it. So we need to reflect. And I, I don't have the answer alone. I, I think very many of you have very good answers. And I can see the chairman and the, uh, his lordship. Uh, I think they can give us some insights on this. Uh, how do we decolonize? I, I told you that uh, the colonial, the second shift was deliberate to inculcate that superiority. I don't know, in Nigeria you still see them trying to, uh, uh, to utilize their own products, even the dressing looks African. She was talking of a gomez. That At that level, at the mindset level, but I think us in, in Uganda, we are still very much uh, mimicking and uh, <clears throat> even if they tell us to, to go boop by Uganda and uh, <laughs> build Uganda, we will not. So I think it's a process. It's, it's a process and uh, it should start with the, uh, you are the future, the, the Graduates, you are the future. Uh, uh, President Museven has tried even to start courses of uh, patriotism, <laughs> but I don't know how much impact they have had. It started the Chankwanzi, but I, I, I think uh, uh, it's not easy to change the human being. That's why it is important to know the humanities and the social sciences in order to really transform this human being. It's not a, a quick fix <laughs> to change a, a human being. Now, the more the educated, uh, the, the uneducated who use the mosquito net uh, for... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> My professor at uh, uh, SOAS London uh, edited a book. Uh, it is uh, The Poor Are Not Us. You can Google it and you will laugh. <clears throat> this was a Maasai man, he's on the cover, dressed like uh, with the sugar, telling the World Bank official that the poor are not us. Because the top-down model, where you think you know, you think you know, they say, <coughs> Ugandans don't have, you don't have a bank account. Is saving only through a bank account? You don't have, you don't eat a dollar a day. You don't uh, 
you have many children beyond the carrying capacity of the household. Therefore, there is a time they told the people in Busoga that they are poor because they are polygamous. The, this Basoga spend the whole day cutting gran, uh, sugar canes and all that, and they give you 100,000 for your whole acre of sugar canes, and you say that you are poor because you have many children when you have been exploited. So, we have this top down, which is wrong. They were telling this man, you stay in a hut, a grass thatched hut, you are in Rugavere, you are, so you are poor. This is what the World Bank and IMF do. You have many children, so let's be humble and listen. I think that's uh, very, very important to listen. Uh, and uh, as Prof said, uh, answering the other uh, lady, <clears throat> if you find that what you have been taught is not relevant, uh, I, I remember one uh, uh, gentleman who used to say on TV that Tori Mwavu, Omutwego Mwavu. So you try to think out, but I know that the context in which you are operating is, uh, is beyond, uh, is determined by other factors, and uh, you may, it may not be hard to change, but uh, I think this calls on all the educationists to see how to change the education system to make it relevant, uh, otherwise uh, uh, our products will be lost and challenged. Thank you. Thank you very much. A big round of applause for our guest speaker. Then another big round of applause to Associate Professor Margaret for that wonderful information they gave us. So that's Max, the end of my session. Over to you, Mr. Moderator. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, let's clap for Noel for taking us through this. Thank you, Noel. Now is the Dean, Faculty of Business, Economics and Governance. And uh, now we have uh, people to graduate. We have graduates from the Certificate of Animal Health, the bridging course. And uh, we have the Dean, the Dean around. The Dean will be assisted by Dr. Mwembe Zewuriyam. Dr. Mwembe Zewuriyam stand up for recognition. Chancellor and Chair Council, this man has revived the program of animal health at Bishop Stuart University. And uh, that this bringing course is only here at BSU. The people who are around here go and tell the world that if they want to be registered by Uganda Veterinary Board, they come to BSU for this course. If they are not registered and then they will be what? Registered. And they will just uh, operate freely in a, a clear environment without being touched and harassed by my OB, Dr. Tichirizu. Again, actually, and from, the, from that organization. Meanwhile, I wish to organize the following as uh, Dr. Karwam and members you organize to come and present your graduates, the Chancellor, for the award. I would also request uh, that you take the microphone. Ha, ah, whom can I send for? Yes, then we also have education later. And uh, let me recognize the people around. We have the Chairman in Badifa, Mr. Mujiz, you are welcome. We also have the manager at Stan Big Bank. He has just gone out. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, I also recognize the press. The press, thank you very much for being here. We have TV West. We have uh, Radio West. We have New Vision. We have Daily Monitor. We have our own Revival Radio. We have Uganda Radio Network. We have, uh, this is it, next key, photographer and videographer. Then we have AIT. AIT, we are online, and uh, people outside 
they have been uh, they are seeing us what we are doing here and everything is online at BSU we do blended we have blended teaching, blended learning and even we have uh, blended public lectures so uh, Madam Dr. Rebecca where I'm going to hand over the microphone to you meanwhile we still have tea and during the tea time we shall be doing networking but as, as we try to uh -huh, with another Dr. Rebecca Dean Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, they said we hold on a bit. That we hold on a bit. That they have gone to get a. That the Chancellor has done a gown. So they have gone for it. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Meanwhile. People who have been playing some music for us. A simple music in the background, if it is possible. Bishop Stewart University, a chartered Christian university and one of the fastest growing universities in Uganda, will hold its 19th graduation ceremony on December 8th, 2023. I'm Professor Gasho Matkunda, Direct University Chancellor Bishop Stuart University. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, the graduates, uh, parents, uh, sponsors, board of trustees, council, management, staff, government of Uganda, all our esteemed partners for the support in this upcoming uh, graduation. This is Chomhendo Jacqueline, Academic Registrar, Bishop Stewart University. We want to congratulate all our potential graduates and thank you for honoring the timelines that we set to ensure that you clear in time and your names are ready for graduation. First, thank you very much. We can't take that for granted. Uh, we shall have our 19th graduation on 8th December. And our guest of honor will be Honorable Dr. Chris Badiomunsi, who is the Minister of Information, Communications, Technology, and National Guidance. Bishop Stewart University, a good trains. Bishop Stewart University, a chartered Christian university and one of the fastest growing universities in Uganda, will hold its 19th graduation ceremony on December 8th, 2023. I'm Professor Gasho Matkunda, the Acting University Chancellor at Bishop Stuart University. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, the graduates, uh, parents, uh, sponsors, board of trustees, council, management, staff, government of Uganda, all our esteemed partners for the support in this upcoming uh, graduation. This is Chomhendo Jacqueline, Academic Registrar, Bishop Stewart University. We want to congratulate all our potential graduates and thank you for honoring the timelines that we set to ensure that you clear in time and your names are ready for graduation. First, thank you very much. We can't take that for granted. Uh, we shall have our 19th graduation on 8th December. And our guest of honor will be Honorable Dr. Chris Badiomunsi, who is the Minister of Information, Communications, Technology, and National Guidance. Bishop Stewart University, a good trains. Bishop Stewart University, a chartered Christian university and one of the fastest growing universities in Uganda, will hold its 19th graduation ceremony on December 8th, 2023. 
I'm Professor Gashwa Matkunda, the acting vice chancellor at Bishop Stuart University. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, the graduates, uh, parents, uh, sponsors, board of trustees, council, management, staff, government of Uganda, all our esteemed partners for the support in this upcoming uh, graduation. This is Chomhendo Jacqueline, uh, Academic Registrar Bishop Stewart University. We want to congratulate all our potential graduates and thank you for honoring the timelines that we set to ensure that you clear in time and your names are ready for graduation. First, thank you very much. We can't take that for granted. Uh, we shall have our 19th graduation on 8th December and uh, our guest of honor will be Honorable Dr. Chris uh, Badiumu. The graduates and present them to the bishop. Welcome, Dr. Mwevembez. Chancellor, council members present, guest speakers, administrators, deans and academicians, students, ladies and gentlemen, I want to begin by uh, pointing out a point of gratitude to thank the university administration, the leadership, for supporting the bridging course. I want to thank the staff who are involved for combining roles. This bridging course is done together with other routine programs, but the, the the staff, the lecturers, who combine roles and do both at the same time. I must say I'm very, very grateful to this. I also want to thank those firms and centers that help us train our people by opening the gates, their farm gates, to, for us to do the teaching inside their farms. Good enough our council chair is one of the, the people who are championing that. He doubles as a farmer and at the same time is our, our, our chair council. So he supports this program. When we talk to him, he even gives us ideas. Uh, finally, I also want to thank the participants because they co-funded this program. The university had a lot to put in, but they also paid money, which money is scarce, and also left their jobs to come to the university and spend two months with us to gain what they have gained. In total, we have 119, she will mention that, but I want to appreciate the ladies. We have got an age, they have an age over the, the gentlemen. I'm not being uh, racist, but the A's that we got, the grade A's, for every five, for every five girls, there was an A. And for every 13 girls, I mean, for, for 13 boys or men, it was one A. And for every five, it was. Do you understand that? So the A's, for the A's, the ladies took the lion's share. And you will soon, soon, soon be told that. Finally, since the COVID, we have registered a number of achievements in that line which they call transformational education. 
I must say that we we have done what we call the ambulatory clinic. The ambulatory clinic is an equivalent of a ward round in a hospital where the lecturers, the professors go with their students to visit student, I mean to visit patients on beds. Then they discuss when they go back to their rooms. We are doing exactly that. We go to the farms, we go with these students, and when we come back, they present in tutorials for other students also to benefit. And we go around and make sure the whole class is covered. That one is in addition to the bridging course, which is a very, very big effort in the line of aiming at adding value to the brand of students that live. The other thing is about the laboratory. We have improved our laboratory. We have made it a teaching laboratory and at the same time a clinical laboratory. We expect our students to learn a lot about the procedures, the biosecurity, and all other <laughs> engagements in the laboratory. <laughs> so with those few remarks, I want to end by thanking you again, thanking our dean for the support, and also finance. We must say a special thank you to finance, because they assisted us to collect money from these students, and they gave it to us to use. That's why we have achieved what we have achieved. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Mwebembezi. In addition to what he has said about the, the ladies, I would also like to mention in this congregation that on Friday, our first, our first class student is a female from the Department of Animal Health. We shall see her on Friday. So I also want to add to what he has said. This program, the bridging course, is only offered at Bishop Stewart University, like um, Dr. Rangile said. And it is a program that enables those who studied um, animal health and animal health related and vet related um, courses in the old curriculum, you can now be retooled at BSU in order for you to acquire what you might have missed in the old curriculum and then be accepted or accredited by um, the Uganda Veterinary Board. So we are very proud for us to be hosting this program in the Faculty of Agriculture. Um, briefly, we have 119 graduates who, uh, who have got this certificate and who are being awarded today. 45 of them are here today. But let me just mention 10 of them, the ones who have attained a certificate. So before the others stand up, let us see, let us uh, first receive the A certificates. Ainembabazi Hilda, if you're here, please stand up. Anyu, Anyujuchire Samuel, Bwanika Rogers, Komjuni Olivias, Kugumi Siriza Esther. Hey, please keep standing. Mwezi Makalista. Mwezi. Muleme Shafik. Msime Didas. Mutejechi Jokonas. Sewari Mark. Yeah, those are the 10 who are getting an A certificate today. Otherwise, the rest of them are 45. Please stand up to receive your award from the Chancellor. We are not giving out the certificates now. They are ready, but uh, a few things are missing. So please stand up as I present you to the Chancellor. The 45. 
Oh, they are not around. What is that? Yes? Okay, I thought the 45 were around. All those who are around, please st stand up. Yes, they are 45. <laughs> okay. These are Kalanzi Fred, Nuamanya Ethro, Tembo Johnson, Kahima Nobat, Biamazima Clement, Bwambale Joachim, Tuyiringire Grace, Mwesige Josphat, Tuinomwezi, Haladson, Begumia Wilbur, Natumanya Ezra, Mandela Nelson, Ainomjisha Cleophas, Natamba Asaf, Nuahereza Jonas, Aturinda Deus, Ampeire Faith, Owenema Victoria, Bira Charlotte, Kamwe Damian, Sewali Mark, Abesga Mukama Bruno, Champere Monica, Cheyune Dan, Bakashaba Daniel, Taremwa Amon, Katwine Lilian, Kirije Dorek, Amompire Edwin, Kato Justus, Kusima Daniel, Mjisha Agre, Bira Charlotte, Kamwebaze Fiona, Twinom Juni Alan, Nuahereza, uh, Nuahereza uh, Nerias, Nuajira Peter, Mjisha Joas, Joash, Musasi the Innocent, Bwanika Rogers. Mr. Chancellor, sir, I present the graduates that have just read to be awarded with a certificate of animal health in the bridging course. By the authority of the university entrusted to me, I congratulate and confer upon all those persons whose names have been read for the award of their certificate in animal health bridging course of Bishop Stewart University in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm privileged once again to say something about the next set of graduates. We have just had the, the question from our discussant, who is to blame? There has been growing concern in higher education about the, the teachers who teach in higher education institutions. You will realize that we have institutions that produce primary school teachers. We have institutions that produce secondary school teachers, but we do not have institutions that produce teachers for universities. So when you have graduates that are not able to perform in the marketplace, or in the workforce, in the labor market, who is to blame? I want to appreciate members of council at Bishop Stewart University and members of top management for realizing this early and considering that the academic staff at BSU ought to be trained to gain the pedagogical competence that is required to produce the kind of graduates that we need today. When this was presented to members of faculty of agriculture, environmental science and technology, they decided to take it up in a manner of showing the way. So they, they decided that 
the faculty members will take up this course, a postgraduate certificate in higher education, which is being offered by our instructors from the faculty of education. And so today, these are the members of staff that are graduating with that certificate. So Thank you. I request that you come here, because you are very few. Come here so that you can be recognized. Um, Mr. Chiguri Cosmas, Chancellor, this we allowed to exempt him from the courses he was teaching. So because he took part in development of those courses and we exempted him and he performed well. Chiguri Cosmas, uh, Mr. Mwanguzi David, uh, Mr. Nkuhe Douglas, uh, Mr. Basura Henry, Mug Basura, yes, Mugumia Noman, Aine Mark, Aine Mark, Job Karema, Mwezi Atha, uh, Kohen. Ainebiona, Ninsima Ebo, Owomujisha Daffin, Amanya Martin, Tukahirwa Prudence, Um, Amanya Bakahanika Bayahakane la Joshua I'm sorry <laughs> Tumhamye Medias Monika Bagaine Babra Esther Kansime Ebo Abel Ayorechide Agawa Julius Korutaro Lilian Dr. Jean Simon Onyait and Mr. Kahoza Richard Mr. Chancellor sir I present you thank you uh, I to note, Chancellor, when the Agriculture Department initiated, or others also developed interest. So we have lecturers across the faculties. Thank you. By the authority of the university entrusted to me, I congratulate and confer upon all those persons whose names have been read for the award of their postgraduate certificate in higher education teaching of Bishop Stewart University, the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Congratulations. Yeah, we shall, we do hope we are going to put in two plaques what you have learned. And as we do monitoring and assessment, we shall be able to know that you are showing the way. Yeah, as we move toward the end, uh, Chancellor amidst us, we have the Guild President. Guild President, come and greet us and invite the Chair Council. Guild President, this is our Guild President. He was consulting me about law. We realized they still have some, uh, some course units to cover. And as at BSU, we ha you have to graduate when we, are, when we are sure that you are fully 
you have you have covered all our course units and that is the work of my office yeah so and uh, guild president uh, greet greet us and invite the chair council to speak to us for the chance i really want to appreciate you permit me to adopt the protocol as per the previous speakers um ankunda best arnold i'm a student at bishop Stuart university pursuing bachelor's in agriculture and community development under the faculty of agriculture environmental science and technology i really want to appreciate everyone for turning up to this best uh, public lecture of Bishop Stuart University 2023. We are gathered together here in this evening with immense of joy and pride, not only to celebrate the graduates taking it home, but also the unity of Bishop Stuart University. That's why you see us students, graduates, we are seated with lecturers and also the university administration thank you very much uh, i want to take this opportunity to thank our facilitators i want to also appreciate on behalf of the students to appreciate the university administration for you have done the best at least to make bishop stuart university shine I'm the 19th Guild President of Bishop Stuart University, where our God reigns, and indeed, God really and surely has reigned to see us graduating and taking it home. I'm too much proud of Bishop Stuart University because it is chartered by the government, the Republic of Uganda, which is too different from other institutions around. That is to thank the Lord for doing that, doing that and bringing it to Bishop Stuart University. This implies that the transcripts we are taking from Bishop Stuart University can be used in the whole world. We need to appreciate that at least. I want to appreciate the university administration for bringing this to us, for bringing us the facilitators, for giving us the best we have gotten from Bishop Stuart University. And I want to affirm to you that we are ready to go and face the world. You deserve a round of applause. And how I prayed, pray, and beg all the institutions to borrow a leaf from Bishop Stuart University because I know we are second to none. Thank you very much. I'm Ankunda Best Arnold, Bishop Stuart University, 19th Guild President. Yeah. I want to take this opportunity to welcome and invite the Chair Council of Bishop Stuart University to give us a word of thought. Thank you very much. Good evening, friends. The Chancellor, the Right Reverend Professor Fred Sharon Mwesigo. We are proud to have you here. The council members uh, who are here and the trustees, you are most welcome. Our guest speakers who have done, <coughs> who done a good job, Professor Godfrey Asimwe and Associate Professor Margaret Kaveya Wafura, we are proud to have you with us. Thank you. The Acting Vice Chancellor, Management, uh, academic staff and student community, we are happy to be associated with you. I recognize also my classmate, 
Dr. Basil, please stand. Up. I am happy we have produced a generation of academics. Our respectable members of the public, I'm especially proud to have Mbadifa here, Farm, Barra Farm Association, where I'm a member, and true life example of engaging the community. I joined the speakers before me to welcome you warmly to Bishop Stuart University, especially the 9BSU community. The topic today is very topical, relevant to the situation, transforming our population from peasants to modern, prosperous, prosperous population. It's a tall order, but there's a proverb that you can eat an elephant mouth by mouth. What's important that we start, we start biting the bones, eh? Good. I hope that all of you, like me, have enjoyed the presentations and discussions from the, from the audience. I particularly hope that the students and the staff have learned what they are not doing. I've also learned what they are doing well. Huh? But important is the students, because as I always emphasize, they are the primary reason why we are here. The rest, from the chancellor to the sweeper, we are support staff. Support staff to the student community. So, if you detect, if you have been provoked by the speakers, that perhaps you should be learning what you are learning better, Perhaps the presentation should be better. Then engage your lecturers and initiate the process of curriculum change and curriculum delivery. I would want you to initiate the process because you are the primary target. Don't cease to be victims of wrong education. So we need self-assessment. On engagement of the community, I don't know if Dr. Onya it is here. And Dr. Mwebe Mbezi. I'm always urging them that they need to encourage their students to take their students to the communities. Eh? And my song is that within two kilometers of Bishop Stuart University, a radius of two kilometers, there are enough cows, there are enough pigs, goats, chicken, poultry farms, banana, beans, maize, everything that they can do practicals every day in the field. Me, when I was doing medicine from third year up to fifth year. This university is capable of doing, and I thank God for it, that Bishop Stewart University is not a glorified secondary school. It is a university whereby there is skill, there is heart, there is uh, hands being used which is very, very important. So I'm so glad this topic is very, very uh, pertinent for the times in which we live. Continue. One of the things I like most here is the business incubation hub at uh, BSU. And in the recent past, there is a student, former student here, who won a very big prize on the national level because when they are here, they are exposed to great ideas. One of the students who used to inspire me very much is one who was doing law, and whenever we would be doing exhibition, you find her demonstrating uh, on what, what was this? How to make, is it charcoal stove, briquettes? Then you ask her, what are you? Then she says, I'm studying law. She's making briquettes. Now, for us, historically, Uganda, we have been disadvantaged because we have been having a compartmentalization of knowledge, specialization, and some of us, in our time, we suffered when we went abroad to study. Because when I was growing up, yeah, you say, me, I'm an artist. Literature, 311. CRE, me, I'm an artist. I'm in the field of humanities. These are scientists. We suffered when I was doing my PhD, and I found that I had to contend with mathematical formulas to draw pie charts, graphs. What do those have to do with CRE, I never knew. Because of the education system, we had been exposed to 
that issue, we need to bridge that gap. So that our students now who grow up will not be, have compartmentalized knowledge. For us, we suffered really, real suffering. So I hope we shall address uh, those gaps. And the mindset, I like that. One of the things that I got exposed to uh, by studying abroad, and I like very much, is the changed mindset. That's why I left England, even when I had one year on my visa. And when I came back, some people said, he has something wrong in his head. Some of my relatives, they couldn't understand because my mindset had changed. My eyes were looking far, see far, because of the things I saw in Europe and I didn't want to associate. One of the things you look at, even the most educated, because the major narrative in the presentation of Dr. Asimo was the foreign ideas that are brought on to affect even our way of doing almost everything that we do. Look at BBC. For you, everybody will say, eh, I'm going to watch news, BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation. Most people never watch those, that when they get more information about the agenda of BBC. I have a book, British Brainwashing Community. That's what it is about. They brainwash with a mindset, a mentality. They have an agenda, liberal, secular, Western values, finished agenda. Everything they do is in line with that. They don't sidetrack at all. CNN, Clinton News Agency, for you call it, call it Cable News Network, Clinton News Agency. It means it represents democratic, liberal values. A cousin to BBC, if you want to know news taking place in, between Ukraine and Russia, don't go to BBC and CNN, because they have an agenda. They have a direction. Point is, mindset. You talked about the banks. Oh, I love that field. We have a circle which has grown. Leaps and bounds. We are in billions in about 10 years. People, you ask them. Everybody goes to, what is your bank? Stand big bank. The other day we were doing a fundraising. We asked them, they can't give you even a shilling. And I take their my money. Why? Uh, uh, I don't, I'm not that foolish any longer. Not even a shilling. Fundraising. Stand big bank makes the biggest profits in Uganda. All the money is repatriated outside. In Europe, when I went to study, I asked, I want to open a bank account. One of my good friends who is liberated in his mind, I said, I'm going to Barclays. He said, you know what Barclays is? Those were the people who were trading in your forefathers in slavery. So I had to make a decision. Mind said, you tell them, join the circle. You can, we have a circle. You, get, you, you even buy shares. Last year, a share was, uh, it made profit, 10,000 made a profit of 3,592. You tell an African, join the circle, you say, uh -uh. I'm not sure I'm safe there. I'll go to Absa Bank. The name sounds nice, you know? I'm in Absa. I'm in Stanbic. I'm in Barclays. Eh? You don't even think about it. You can get shares. You can get dividends. Anyway, let me run. But I like the topic. It's really so exciting. We need to work on our mindset. And if we don't, we shall be dominated. And that's why you were appreciating Archbishop Kazimba and the Anglican Church. We said, away with the money. Away with the money. We cannot be affected because the mindset will be uh, affected. I pray and hope that we shall look for ways. Let me go to the last part of the function. I want to congratulate those who have gotten certificates and the departmental head, I think, forgot. He doesn't know. I think he forgot that in the battles that you fight, 
They are even trustees who are involved. That matter troubled us very much. We could not sleep. We got messages in our phone, chancellor, abuses of all kinds. We were working tooth and nail to make sure that, I don't know where the problem started from of animal health, but we had to engage with ministers, honorable Ramirama, whatever, agriculture minister, whatever, council, at that level. So, Dr. Mwebe, so not only administration and the you need also, in your perspective, to remember that there are other stakeholders who really... And for the students, the noise that you made complaining, you go out now and make noise about the certificate you have gotten. Say BSU is the best that you can ever get. Because I've heard Dr. Rwangere say, it is only here that this course is. Only here, that's what he's saying. So the same noise you made should be the same noise you make as you display your certificates, as you tell other people, you people, what are you doing? In BSU, we are like this. Praise the Lord. <laughs> okay. So congratulations for the certificates, and I pray that you will go and apply the theory and practice, and thank you so much, deans, for the great work you are doing, and the emphasis of theory and practice which will be important for employability and marketability of our, can, our products as they go out. So, may the Lord God bless you. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. A prayer? Yes, we can pray. Stand up, we pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this great evening and for your blessings that are new every other day, every other morning. May you continue to bless us. Thank you for the great wisdom that we have been able to listen to this evening. And we pray that you continue to bless these, your children, as they continue to research more, as they continue to assist us more in understanding, but also as we get helped in thinking through how best we can be able to address the challenges that we have instead of only lamenting about them. Give us practical solutions so that we shall be able to make a difference, especially as we engage with the community so that this university will be relevant to the people that it serves and from the people from whom these students come and for the good of this nation and in line with the goals of this nation and even international goals of development. May you bless us. May you help us also to, able, to be able to understand and appreciate the dynamics of what is going on in the world. Because if we do not understand and appreciate the same way these, our brothers and sisters, have been able to, we shall not know even our enemies. We shall not even know those who do not mean well to us. But when we do, then we shall get solutions. Bless us and guide us. And for these students who have graduated, may you bless them. Thank you that, Lord, finally they've been able to accomplish a task that was still hanging in the balance. Thank you that, Lord, we were able to overcome this big problem also, which was there, the gap that has been filled. May you bless them as they go out to work. We also pray for the graduates who are preparing for graduation and all the university administration and all the preparations that they will all go well. Thank you for the university administration, the council, and all key stakeholders, and all the parents who look for the fees and tuition. We thank you, we praise you, we honor you. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ. Blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon you all, and particularly be upon our guest speakers, Dr. Simwe, and our sister, Dr. Wafula. May that blessing never leave you all now and always. Amen. Hello?
Uh, don't leave you sit. Yeah, we, you sit. We still have one item on the agenda. We still have tea. We want to recognize the the students of law. Uh, students of law certificate. We recognize you. Students of BSU around. Please. Uh, we still we have tea, and this tea has been prepared for us. Don't leave it. And please, I'm I'm bring the first. Uh, Barbara, arrange. Come and take the, the high table for tea. Yeah, please don't leave our tea. We have tea. Uh, we have tea with sumbusa, with eggs, with everything. Please don't leave the tea. We shall, everybody the has to take about university, three cups. Christian University and one of the fastest growing universities in Uganda will hold its 19th graduation ceremony on December 8th, 2023. I'm Professor Gasho Matkunda, the Act University Chancellor at Bishop Stuart University. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, the graduates, uh, parents, uh, sponsors, board of trustees, Council, management, staff, government of Uganda, all our esteemed partners for the support in this upcoming uh, graduation. This is Chomhendo Jacqueline, uh, Academic Registrar Bishop Stewart University. We want to congratulate all our potential graduates and thank you for honoring the timelines that we set to ensure that you clear in time and your names are ready for graduation. First, thank you very much. We can't take that for granted.